Welcome everyone to the second season premiere of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society's Astrophotography Special Interest Group. It is great to have you all here on uh, Zoom and uh, those few of you here in person. We do have more people on Zoom than in person, which uh, may mean a change in format for future Zoom meetings or future SIG meetings, which means we'll probably exclusively meet on Zoom in the future, especially if we have a speaker on Zoom like we do tonight. But uh, by and large, I think we'll kind of stick to the Zoom meetings, at least for the foreseeable future. Anyway, we have a, a fantastic uh, guest speaker with us tonight on Zoom. Uh, but first, before we begin, let me just give you a, a quick sneak preview of the upcoming uh, SIG season. Because I know what happens right after the talk, everyone tends to skip out. And uh, I wanted to give everyone a preview uh, of what we have coming up. So here on the screen is the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society's website, the award-winning website. Um, so all you have to do to find out what's coming up is either go through the slideshow here. You can see here's the SIG meeting here tonight. But to see what's coming up, just go to the activities page. You can go to the schedule of events page, but you'll see everything there. General meetings, SIG meetings, observing sessions, et cetera, et cetera. But to see what's going on with the Astrophoto SIG, you just click on the Astrophotography SIG. You can read the uh, who, what, uh, when, where, and why of the SIG here. And of course, this is where uh, those of us in person uh, are now at Rood Hall. And you can see the schedule here, or you can uh, um, open up the uh, flyer here. You can uh, print this out and stick it on your refrigerator, which I encourage everyone to do. So, of course, uh, you can see our speaker tonight, but let me give you a quick preview for next month, which I will do toward the end here tonight as well. Uh, next month, we have Agapios Alia joining us uh, via Zoom from Cyprus, not like Cyprus, Michigan, but the actual island in the Mediterranean. Uh, Agapios uh, joined us uh, back in February and gave an excellent talk on planetary imaging, you know, the more general aspect of planetary imaging. And you can find that talk on our YouTube channel. But what Agapios will be doing, as you can kind of get a hint of from the title, is at his time, which will be about 3 a.m. when we start the SIG meeting, is uh, he's going to image Mars live during the meeting. And then when he's done, he's going to process the results. So you can basically see, you know, from beginning to end, the uh, process of capturing an image of at least Mars in this case. And then in December, our own Pete Mumbauer, who's uh, here in person with us tonight, will give a more technical talk. So if you're looking for the really technical oriented uh, SIG talks, this will be one for you. So he'll uh, be talking about everything you need to know about flats. And then come January, uh, legendary Canadian amateur astronomer Jack Newton will be showing us how he accumulates and, uh, you know, images and processes his images of the sun. And he's an excellent solar imager, as, as, as our speaker is tonight as well. And then Lloyd Simmons, who I believe is joining us on Zoom. Shame on him, by the way. Uh, he'll be talking about NINA, which is, of course, a very, very popular uh, free uh, telescope control program, you know, telescope uh, uh, camera control program that, that many, many people use. So um, if you're looking for a, a good free uh, all-purpose program, uh, you, you can attend that talk in February. And then to kind of finish up the season, uh, Zolt Lieve, who's actually quite well known, uh, he's maybe best known for uh, processing Hubble Space Telescope images. But uh, I've asked him to give a presentation on uh, night sky photography, you know, landscapes, uh, mainly like the Milky Way, maybe a little bit of star trails and constellations and stuff like that. So you'll notice uh, last year we had the SIG from September to April. Uh, but, you know, I, I used all the meeting suggestions I got, and this is kind of what we came up with. So uh, I, I like the idea of starting the SIG meetings after astrophotography night, which, which, which is what we do at the general meeting every, every year. But uh, it, if we do want to do an April meeting, uh, then someone's welcome to find a guest speaker to speak in April. Otherwise, I think we'll go uh, from October to March. 
And so um, what you can do is go back to the uh, schedule here on the, on the website and you can add everything to your calendar so you don't forget. Uh, you know, uh, of course you can register for many of these meetings on Zoom right now, but I, I know you don't want that stuff hanging around your inbox for, forever. So you can add it to your calendar, you know, um, Cortana or uh, Alexa or whatever will remind you. And uh, th then you can register for the Zoom meeting then, because I'm I'm pretty sure we're going to meet uh, exclusively on Zoom uh, starting next month. So let me go ahead and stop the share there. So that's a preview of what we have coming up. Lots of lots of great presentations. So let's uh, let's get right into it. So uh, tonight's guest speaker is a self-taught photographer based in Michigan with a background in science and engineering. Over the last decade, he has taken a particular interest in the discipline of astrophotography. His work has been internationally awarded, published, and exhibited through various outlets, including NASA's Astronomy Picture of the Day, uh, Pictures in Astronomy Magazine, and Sky and Telescope Magazine, and also the Astronomy Photographer of the, of the Year, and many others. So without uh, further ado, please welcome Jason Gunzel. I hope I pronounced your last name uh, correctly there, Jason. I might have to give you permission to uh, unmute there. So just a second, here we go. Yeah, hello everyone. Sorry, my hands were tied with the mute button for a minute there. Um, well, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Um, and you, you gave a nice in, in, intro and I'm super impressed with the participation you have in this group here. Um, over 40 people online, and I don't know how many are in the room there. Uh, at least 80. At least 80? <laughs> no, less. Well, that's, uh, I mean, that's impressive for, you know, I'm a, I'm a participant in a special interest group we have around Metro Detroit, and um, <laughs> It's not a fraction of this participation, so yeah, that's a that's impressive. Um, but you do have an, an excellent lineup of speakers, and so I'm I'm honored, and um, I thank you for in, inviting me here. Um, I, I want to um, you know go through this presentation. Um, I put a quite a bit of video content in here, so hopefully it plays well over the Zoom. Uh, if not, <laughs> let me know. But I wanted to be there in person, I uh, wasn't able to at this time, so it uh, looks like I'm joining the many over Zoom. Um, I'm hoping that this can be kind of a, a loose form meeting. You know, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. I, I think I do well as more of a conversationalist than um, a straight up presenter, so uh, I got a little bit I would say overwhelmed putting this presentation together because of the breadth of it. I just you know, wanted to give kind of some background on how I got into this hobby and, and um, you know, the different aspects of it, but I really dipped my toes into all aspects of it. And I didn't want to get too deep or technical in, um, in any one particular zone, but i um, hoping that this presentation maybe spawns um, some questions or some participation from the audience. So feel free uh, absolutely to interrupt me if you ever uh, have a question on anything I'm talking about or, or um, you want to want to see something again or, or any of that. And uh, I'll go through uh, the presentation as it is. And at the end, I've got just some show and tell of images and um, well, we can go through all that if we have time. If not, I won't be disappointed if some of that gets cut off. So I'll try to be mindful of time and and um, I guess I'll get right to sharing. Let me see if I can. Uh, share this and please uh, let me know if this comes through, OK? We're good to go, Jason. Yeah, you're seeing my screen? We do. And by the way, I, I have everyone at home muted so they can't unmute themselves. So we'll take questions after the talk if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. I just don't want, you know, I um, I structured it so I can talk right through it. Um, but like I said, you know, I 
if questions pop up, I mean, they might get drowned out by the, by the end of this. So um, I understand why you do it. Um, so um, it's fine with me if you want to allow people to unmute themselves. I won't be offended if I get interrupted, but um, that's up, entirely up to you. Uh, I'll just go through the talk as is. So you can see my um, title page here. Yes. Okay. And everyone can un unmute themselves now, so so people can ask okay. questions. Okay. I'll maybe I'll learn to regret that later, but <laughs> we'll see. Um, so, like a, um, like I was introduced, um, you know, I'm an amateur astrophotographer. I, I kind of developed this passion or this interest um, a little bit later in life. Uh, you know, I'm getting up to middle age now, so. Um, you know, this is, wasn't something I did from, from my youth, although the interest was always there. Um, I'll kind of walk through how this all uh, came about and, and kind of where I'm at now. So the title of this presentation is Capturing the Cosmos, A Journey into Astrophotography. And that's basically what I'm going to talk through is, is um, how I developed in this, in this hobby. Uh, my name is Jason Genzel. Um, it's pronounced Genzel all the time, so don't, <laughs> don't feel bad. Um, I once pronounced my name in Germany and I got a lot of uh, strange faces back at me. So this is an Americanized way to say it anyway. But, um, again, I'll uh, just hop right through it and I've got video content. My first slide in is a video. Um, so hopefully this plays smoothly, but I've been working a lot um, because of the change with social media and the more video focused content into animating uh, some of my astro photos. So this, this little intro, Spiel is about 30 seconds long, and it's a, like a 3D representation of uh, a deep sky target. And this is the Cat's Eye Nebula, for those who are familiar. This is a deep look into the Cat's Eye, and then we're zooming into the core of the Cat's Eye Nebula. Uh, one of the things I try to focus on in my astrophotography is, is um, maybe presenting things a little bit differently or with an artistic um, spin. And then trying to get into to details that are uh, more rarely seen. So um, that's why I kind of do these video presentations to give movement and um, interest to otherwise static interest or static uh, images. I just want, will ask one question. Is this video playing smoothly since I have so many uh, in this presentation? Yeah, it's fine. Good? Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's doing fine, Jason. All right, good. All right, so a little bit, I got a few slides here about my journey into astrophotography and really my interest started in childhood. Um, and my, my parents did sponsor that. You know, I, I took, we took family vacations down to Florida, visited Kennedy Space Center, got the opportunity to see space shuttle launches. Um, and this was in the mid eighties. Um, about the age of 10, they gifted me a telescope, which is the one that you see on the screen here. It was a, just a department store refractor, um, 60 millimeter Jason reflect, refractor. And I thought it was kind of cool because I had my name on the side, but um, it afforded me the opportunity to, to get some looks at uh, planets and the moon um, from the suburbs. I grew up just outside of Detroit. And I am still on this telescope, this picture I took uh, just this past summer, I set it up and I put the iPhone to the eyepiece and I recorded that video you see there on the right hand side. So kind of cool. It's still uh, making decent images, although I don't ever use it. I just did it as kind of a demonstration that um, even something as, as basic or as as old as this telescope um, still, still can function and, and uh, give even... Um, youngsters of this generation that same opportunity. So, you know, I gave kids the opportunity to look through it. It's kind of cool, um, came full circle with the childhood interest. Um, I got married in 2008 and in 2009, uh, for the first anniversary, we took a trip up to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. We left home without a camera and I thought that was kind of a dumb idea. So on the way we stopped at uh, Costco and I picked up this um, digital camera uh, on the way. This this is the one picture in the lower left. It's a Canon uh, Rebel T1i, just kind of a basic DSLR. And the kit lens. Um, always had an interest in 
in landscape photography. So I figured this um, would do. And that little camera took me a long way. I, I still have it and uh, still use it to this, this day. And uh, it's got, like I said here, hundreds of thousands of clicks on that shutter. Uh, the two images you see here are what I consider my first astrophotos uh, taken from a hotel balcony on that trip. Um, this is in Munising overlooking um, that's Grand Island on the left and Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore uh, in front and the crescent moon with Venus below it rising um, in 2009. And I even had the uh, wherewithal at this point to, to kind of play with exposures and, and take multiple exposures to get the, uh, the crescent moon properly exposed and also uh, get a look at the earth shine so you can kind of see that here. Um, I didn't even have proper equipment at this point. I was just, uh, I didn't have a tripod. I just kind of set up the camera on a, on a chair. And uh, even at this, this stage, I was experimenting with, you know, what it takes to develop an astro photo. So continuing along on that journey, I, I used that camera to, to, you know, my interest was sparked. So I just started taking pictures of the sky and uh, I was pretty terrible at first. Um, what you see in the center there is my first attempt at the Andromeda galaxy. And I set it up on a fixed tripod with a nifty 50 lens, just pointed it up where I thought Andromeda would be. I caught it. It looks like junk at this point, in my opinion, but um, I was super excited by this. It, uh, I lined it up with the best shot of Andromeda I could find. And I, I realized that, all right, I've got, you know, M110 in there and I can see I can, I can line up all the stars. I can see the faint uh, outline of a dust lane. And uh, really from there, I, I thought, okay, I, I can do this. I need to see what it takes. So I, as I said on the slide, I obsessively started studying what do I need in terms of equipment? Uh, how can I do this better? How do I edit it and stack it? And, and what software do I need? And then by 2013, I, I bought a telescope and I can, was kind of on my way. Um, you can see just a few years later, I took that same picture with the same camera, a uh, different telescope and setup, but the framing here between the two pictures is the same and, and uh, it's just uh, remarkable, the progression uh, just in a, in a few short years with the attention to, to what it takes to actually make, make an astrophoto. And then moving along, you know, as I got a, a better telescope, this is the through an eight inch SCT of Andromeda also. And, uh, you know, within a, a few years of taking that first photo, I'm resolving individual blue supergiant stars in uh, NGC 206, which is in the center here. Um, you know, capturing the detail in the galaxy, which I had never imagined uh, I would be able to do. So just a little bit more about me. Um, like I said, lifelong interest in space and astronomy. And as Richard said in the intro, I've, I've got a background in science and enge uh, engineering. I went to University of Michigan. I have an aerospace engineering degree. I worked in several industries, uh, aerospace, automotive, which br brought me back to the area. And I also worked in HVAC for a while. Mostly in product design and development, uh, did analysis and testing. So kind of uh, all the engineering disciplines um, I, I went through. These days, um, you know, I still shoot in astrophotography. I enjoy sharing it on social media as a form of, of public outreach. So I've been fortunate enough to build a, a large um, social media following and I kind of uh, continue to post and, and develop with those platforms, um, trying to keep my work visible um, to people who might not necessarily have a background in science or, or just casually curious about space. So I really enjoy doing that and kind of um, putting a foot forward on the education side of it to make sure people understand what they're looking at. And along the way, um, I was fortunate enough to get, you know, several awards and accolades for my work, uh, NASA Astronomy Picture of the Day, this Astronomy Photographer of the Year um, 
competition that they run out of England. I was able to get uh, images exhibited. Actually, there's one in there right now in the uh, National Maritime Museum in, in Greenwich, England um, for the 2022 um, Astronomy Photographer of the Year competition. And, and Astroban uh, was awarded several Image of the Days and then um, also several print publications. I didn't mention on here, there's several online outlets that have also um, distributed my work and published my work online. All right, so uh, circling back around to astrophotography at a glance, um, I want to go into a little bit about, you know, my experience in astrophotography, kind of um, where I found my footing and, and the directions I've decided to go. Really, you can break up uh, amateur astrophotography into two main categories, and that's the the science side of it and the pretty picture side of it. Um, a lot of people, uh, amateur astrophotographers are making great strides in the science side of it, um, doing things like uh, photometry of you know variable, variable star um, transits, even exoplanets are, are, are um, becoming prominent now for, for amateurs to, um, to do exoplanet timings and light curves. Uh, there's opportunities in spectroscopy, uh, planetary research, and um, occultations and timings. So a lot you can do on the science side if you're into that. Um, I focus more on the right-hand side, which is just making pretty pictures. Um, just because I like it, um, they're easy to share, they, they grab people's interest. And um, I like the intermingling of art into the astrophotography as well. So broken out here, all the disciplines, there are sub-disciplines of this. Um, and I consider the main pillars here, deep sky, planetary, and nightscapes. But as part of those or subsets of those, um, there's all these different things you can, you can be involved in or, or image. So uh, things like solar imaging, I got uh, very involved in that. Uh, lunar uh, imaging comets and satellites, things like uh, ISS or uh, special events like um, going in, and seeing eclipses and meteor showers and, and uh, being in place for certain conjunctions or alignments or even uh, chasing the Northern Lights, which I've, I've done also. So all these, all these things you can be involved in. And I'm hoping that my talk today maybe spawns a little interest or inspires people to go out and, and kind of do these things because, uh, you know, I got my inspiration from viewing this stuff online, and, and I think um, that goes a long way toward um, generating interest and in, in getting people involved in the hobby in general. So I kind of pause there. Um, I just want to make sure that everything's coming through all right and you can uh, hear me okay. And, um, everything's good. If any questions, I'll let people speak. But. We good? We're good. All right, good, thanks. All right, so moving forward, um, I underline here the discipline of astrophotography because, it, you know, it really does take a lot of discipline and it, it's not for everyone. I'm often asked, you know, how, how do you do astrophotography or how do you, how do you get into it? Uh, how do you get better at it? And, I think it really boils down to, to having the right personality or the right traits. So you, you have to be a stubborn person. Um, what goes along with the curiosity is, is just persistence. And at some point you have to brute force these things. You know, if you, if you want to learn how to do it, if you want to get better at it, um, making mistakes is the best teacher. Um, and that, I guess that uh, willingness to fail goes into the persist persistence and the dedication. You have to, you know, push through those things. You have to be adaptive, learn what it takes to make a better image, to get better results and, and follow those up. And so really the most useful skill in all of this is problem solving. And um, I can't stress that enough. If you, if you can't look at an image or look at your results, assess 
where the shortfalls are and what you need to do to improve, you're not going to get very far. And um, that's kind of a harsh reality, but it is the reality because um, learning what it takes is, is half the battle. And you may not know the answers up front, but you have to know where to look to research this stuff. Um, and people go to different places. Some use uh, online resources like forums or um, uh, tutorials, uh, YouTube videos. Some people like uh, printed materials, books and things like that. I mean, these are all things you can get um, and avenues you can pursue, but really it comes down to, to assessing where you are and, and where you wanna be and what you need to do to get there. All right, so uh, everybody that's got a passing interest in astrophotography really um, likes the gear. And, and uh, so I'll run down what I use today. I've generally kept most of what I have. There's only a few pieces of gear I've switched out. And I list here the main components uh, being telescopes, mounts, and cameras, but the ancillary gear, um, what you need to make this equipment run. Um, I could fill <laughs> a small small novel with. I mean, it's just, um, you know, everything from cabling to USB hubs to, to software, it's just, uh, it's uh, overwhelming at, at times, but uh, you really, you know, need all this stuff to make these systems home. But the, you know, the, the main components here, uh, the telescopes, I've used um, several, but, they're all geared towards um, some sort of specialization. So uh, the main one, which I list here first is my Celestron Edge HD, which is in the center of this image on the right. That telescope is the first telescope, the first modern telescope I, I bought. And I use that one all the time. That's my favorite telescope to shoot through. I use it mainly for deep sky astrophotography. Um, but I picked up uh, along the way an Explore Scientific uh, six inch achromatic refractor. That's the AR152. And I use that mainly for solar and, and I've used it for deep sky also. I've got a couple of imaging Newtonians, uh, the larger of which is on the right here, the 12 inch. I use that for uh, planetary and lunar imaging. And um, the TPO ultra wide, which is um, a new favorite, that's a very low cost telescope, but it's uh, got uh, just 180 millimeter focal length. So I can use that to get really wide field images. So I use that for deep sky now. And I use uh, DSLRs still with lenses. Um, the mounts, I got the three you see here, which are just the uh, Orion Atlas Pro, the Skywatcher EQ6R and the Celestron AVX. I also have a small star tracker, which I use for nightscapes, the Star Adventure. I got a whole stable of ZWL cameras I use for deep sky and planetary uh, listed out here. These couple of uh, DSLRs and then I also use the GoPro for uh, night time lapses. Software uh, is a whole different animal. Um, I use, I've used many more than are on this list, but uh, generally I use uh, Photoshop, Photoshop, PixInsight and um, After Effects and Lightroom for general processing. Uh, I also use the Topaz Labs uh, software uh, for certain processes. Um, for capturing Deep Sky, I use Sequence Generator Pro. For Planetary, I use Fire Capture and uh, the PhD2 just for guiding. Uh, planetary, uh, I use Auto Stacker, which is the video plane here for, for capture. Um, and some other softwares here, PIPP and IMPPG and WinJupos for, uh, to assist in planetary processing. And for planetary, uh, planetarium software, I use uh, Sky Safari for Nightscape, a uh, software called, or it's actually a phone app called Planet Pro. And for weather forecasting, mainly I'm using Astrospheric. But I've tried out and used much more than this. I uh, won't we'll get into to the details, but um, this is just generally what I use. A bit about location. I shoot mainly from my backyard and that's uh, 
not the best of situations. I live just outside of Detroit. Uh, my the Bortle six skies. Just to get to Bortle three or darker, which is blue on this chart, I'm looking at about a two and a half hour drive minimum. So I've I've done that from time to time, though it's pretty rare. Um, I get out and shoot anything but nightscapes from darker skies. If I do attempt it, I uh, in the lower peninsula. I mean, you can look at the map here, but you got to get to the uh, to the upper half of the lower peninsula just to get to Bortle three. And uh, the best places are along the lake shores or perhaps um, in these uh, national forests. The two over on the left here is the Manistee National Forest, and then over on the right is the Huron National Forest. Those are about the best places in the lower peninsula. And then uh, if you can get up to the upper peninsula, pretty much anywhere is good. All right, so um, that's really about my background and kind of what I use to to um, to take these astrophotos. So I'm going to focus in now on what I consider the main pillars of astrophotography, which are the, the deep sky images, planetary imaging, and, and nightscape. So I'm going to go through each one of these and talk a little bit about what I do to, 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 to uh, image each of these categories. And um, <clears throat> This image in the background, obviously, is an extreme close-up of the, um, maybe not obviously, but it is an extreme close-up of the elephant trunk. Um, a lot of times, you know, I kind of differentiate my image. I fo focus on presenting it in a different way and uh, doing some of these close-up images is a, kind of a unique way to look at these things. You generally don't see things at this scale, except for um, professional observatories. All right, so for deep sky astrophotography, I, I included a picture of my setup on the previous slide, but this is um, just a different one. This is my back patio, and I, when I image deep sky, a lot of times I'll have multiple setups running. I don't have anything permanent at, at my house, and that's mainly because the best place for me to image in my yard is right in my, on my back patio, and I'm not able to build an observatory there, so. I do tear down and set up every night I image, but I do certain things to enable a quick setup and, and I tear down. And that's mainly is uh, I try to keep things in, in one piece where I can, if I can manage carrying them, I still um, tend to lug things out in one piece. And that way all I have to do is hook up data and power polar line and I'm kind of off to the races. Uh, I do control everything from inside the house. So I run my cables into the inside of the house and an image from there. But generally speaking for deep sky astrophotography, consistency is paramount. And I can't stress that enough, you know, to enable getting these long exposures and to, to configure your gear to run reliably and repeat repeatedly night after night, you have to figure out a way to, to uh, make things consistent. And like I said, the one thing I do is just leave things assembled. That enables me to, to not have to take calibration frames every night. I can, um, by not disassembling the camera from the imaging train, I can use my flats over a long range of time, um, sometimes months at a time. It enables that quick nightly setup and then you know, I automate things as much as I can. I've got all my scopes set up with uh, auto focusers or motorized focusers so I can get that piece uh, settled and not have to come back and refocus every night. And um, I use Sequence Generator Pro for Deep Sky so I can sequence up my target, my targeting and exposures uh, throughout each, each night. So a lot of times I'll spend multiple nights spanning sometimes months to get a, an image on just a single target. And I'll break that the imaging nights and up into several targets just to uh, make sure I'm imaging things when they're optimal, optimi, optimally placed in the sky. 
And that's really a segue into this next slide. Um, I image from light pollution and uh, this is an example of a terrible night, <laughs> but it's one that, you know, my telescope would image right through if I wasn't careful to uh, weed out these frames or, or know that this was going on in the night sky, you know, I might inadvertently stack these into my, into my frame um, because my telescope will continue to guide and continue to image through these conditions, even though it's light clouds, um, the stars aren't blotted out enough to uh, make the telescope uh, fail auto guiding and, and stop taking exposures. So I really have to be cautious when I set it up to image um, that I go through my frames afterwards and know that, <laughs> that I've got a situation like this going on. Um, this, the, the haze and the glow around the horizon, this is a real phenomenon and it's an issue that I deal with on a nightly basis. Because not only does that light pollution add a pedestal of brightness to your image, but also adds an incredible amount of noise. So to mitigate that, I shoot many, many short exposures, um, anywhere from minute to, you know, just a few minutes if I'm shooting a narrow band image. And I, I stack those into, you know, very long total exposures. I generally get into the 20 to 30 to 40 hour range in a lot of images. And that's just to average down the, the impact of light pollution. Um, some other tricks or tools to, is optical filtering. And I use narrow band filtering whenever the moon is up or if I've got a target that's low on the horizon. And I always sequence up my um, events through Sequence Generator Pro to make sure that I'm um, imaging them that when they're high in the sky or as high as possible. And so I'll set start and end times, or um, you can set altitude limits on these targets so that once something reaches um, a threshold, a low threshold, it'll bounce over to the next target on the list. So I really take advantage of that to try to make sure that I get the best data possible um, given the conditions that I'm shooting under. And then the steps I go through to develop an astrophoto, um, those on the, on the meeting here, I know a lot of you are astrophotographers. Um, if you're not into it, there's just a ton of steps that go into this. Um, I do make videos um, geared towards people who have no idea how these things are made. And one of them's playing over on the right-hand side here. But I take these hundreds of sub, sub exposures and I run them through PixInsight to stack them. Um, I, I pre-process them all um, with calibration frames to get the illumination as consistent as possible. I weight them for quality. That's one of the ways I weed out the, the shots with bad transparency or uh, high light pollution gradients. I align them and then the stacking takes care of uh, rejecting defects in the images and um, has the result of reducing the noise. I also uh, use PixInsight for deconvolution, which allows me to process for ultimate detail. Once I get these master frames, um, I process them individually and then combine them into a full color image. And I usually use uh, Photoshop for final color adjustments and um, all kinds of, I'll say more artistic uh, photographic adjustments to, to the images. So the, the one that's playing over here on the right shows just the steps that go into, um, it's a screen capture of my SGP output, um, capturing the, these images live. And then it goes into what a single image looks like, which is basically pure black. And then uh, once you stretch those, you begin to see what's coming up in the background. This is the Flaming Star Nebula. Once I average a bunch together, the noise reduction happens and then I can add the contrast and uh, the RGB frames in this image add that pop of color and then uh, star reduction or star removal allows you to see all the detail in the background. All right, uh, moving on to, to planetary. Um, 
I really take time to, to try to get better at this. It's a huge challenge um, from our northern latitude to get excellent results uh, imaging, and that's just because plants are are low for us in Michigan, and so uh, you got to take care to to get while the getting's good. You got to wait for stable um, atmospheric conditions, and you and you also have to try to shoot the planets when they're as high as possible, which isn't always um, something you can do, but uh, the good news for us is that they're getting higher every year, at least over the next few years. All right, so um, much the same as deep sky, my planetary setup is non-permanent. It also weighs a ton more than my deep sky setup, so I can't move this all in one piece. So I end up um, you know, breaking it down into the components and moving it outside, hooking it up and aligning it. It's generally more involved than um, deep sky imaging for me because I have to you know, keep my focus and attention on it throughout the night. I still set things up to image from inside, but um, aligning and um, taking all the exposures means that I need to stay up. And uh, generally my planetary nights are all nighters, uh, so I can't do it all the time, but um, I do enjoy it and I feel like I've improved quite a bit. Um, the setup I use for planetary astrophotography is this image, uh, Shown on the right here, it's a 12 inch Newtonian um, on an overloaded Skywatcher EQ6R. I use a 5X power mate to get the Im image amplification out of the out of telescope. And then uh, the ASI 183mm Pro camera is what I use to capture planetary through a, a filter wheel. This isn't the, I would say, most optimum planetary camera simply because it's got a large chip and um, a lot of pixels. But I generally crop it into a, a region of interest so I can get high frame rate out of it. And it seems to work okay. For the planetary scope, I home built an ASCOM belt drive motorized focuser. It's gone through a few iterations, but uh, that, that that's key to letting me image from inside. So I, I can view the real-time images or video coming in on the computer and I can adjust focus accordingly. Planetary astrophotography is a, a lesson in, in getting all the details ironed out. And uh, namely, you gotta be super detail-oriented to get good results. Um, you gotta pay attention to the collimation um, atmospheric stability is a huge issue, um, so I use Astrophere to get a forecast on that and uh, really uh, get a feel for the, the uh, conditions before I set up. Uh, the main thing to look at for planetary is the seeing. Uh, it can be fairly rare to get good seeing in Michigan, so if I see good seeing on the forecast, I generally try to set up. Uh, focus, I still do that by eye with planetary to use um, the motorized focuser and, and real-time time feedback to get the focus really as optimal as I can get it. And then, um, as I said, shooting from northern lat latitudes, one issue we come across is atmospheric dispersion or color fringing in the image of the planet. And the, really the only way to get around that is to use a corrector, which is an op optical element that goes in front of the camera to correct for dispersion or to shoot with a monochrome camera and limit the filter ranges, uh, which is what I do. And I shoot multiple short videos and I stack those and then average those into larger sets. So that has the effect of reducing the noise in my image. Um, fire capture allows me to auto center and auto guide on the planet. So I can just track on the planet all night long without having to worry about drift or anything like that. Planetary is, uh, key to planetary is the sharpening. And there's multiple ways you can go about this, but really the mechanism here, which allows for sharpening is to stack these images, um, 
into a master. The raw stack generally is rather blurry looking, but um, through deconvolution routines, which is available in most uh, processing software or wavelet sharpening, you can take that blurry raw stack and, and uh, sharpen it up. And then I do this to each channel and then color combine it into a final image. Um, another step in planetary is to um, derotate for planets that rotate really fast. So I use wind jupos uh, on targets like Jupiter to uh, remove the rotational blurring that you'll get from imaging over a long period of time. Offshoot of planetary is lunar and solar, which I get involved in also. Solar requires a dedicated scope. Um, I use this setup with the AR-152 to get uh, really close up details on the sun. You can see an active region here shown on the, on the right. I use that the Newtonian to get close ups of uh, lunar craters also that's shown on the left. All right, so for nightscape um, astrophotography, it's another thing I really enjoy. I don't get the chance to get out and do it as much as I'd like. But for nightscape, uh, portability is key, and um, you just kind of find some dark skies and an interesting foreground, and you're kind of off to the races here. I use a DSLR. Um, I don't have a modified one. I just use a, a standard stock uh, Canon 60 on top of a tracking mount and a tripod and, and just shoot that way. Um, this is the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society, so I figured a Bell's beer would also... Um, be a required accessory, so that's shown there. <laughs> uh, in the background uh, of my my zoom background is this image I show I, I show here. This is uh, up from the, the uh, summit of Haleakala, which I had the pleasure of being uh, up there this last February to shoot some night sky. Um, very enjoyable experience if you ever get the the means to get out there. But what I like to do, um, and there's a lot of schools of thought on, on you know, blending different foregrounds into astrophotography or, or making composites. I just like using the available light at the scene. Um, and because I shoot long exposures to get the, the dim foreground with the, with the sky balanced, I end up shooting tracked exposures for the sky and static for the ground. And I blend those together in post-processing. So that's what you see here. Um, I'll take a set of sky exposures on the left and a set of ground exposures you can see on the right and combine those and merge those into one image, which is the image at the bottom. So those are the two component exposures that went into this final one. Um, and a lot of times, the, the, you know, the, the blending can be done in, the, in a haze layer at the horizon or if you've got a a strong foreground element with a crisp horizon. It's pretty straightforward to, to get uh, a good mask line and, and Photoshop these days. So uh, that's generally where I'll do the, the combination of in, images. All right, so, you know, that is a summary of what I consider the pillars of astrophotography. I've got a bunch of example images we can look through. I know I've uh, looking at the time here and I've pretty much uh, gone close to an hour, so I can kind of cruise through those. But I wanted to take this opportunity to, to ask if there's any questions from the audience or, or anything um, that the group would like to discuss more before I kind of go through a show and tell of, of images I've captured. Anybody here in person? look that way Jason. Okay well I hope uh, you know I hope that this is a, a kind of a good overview. I like I said you know once I got into putting this together I realized just how much subject matter there is to to go through here and I hope that it's not you know too specialized or um, too general for the audience that you know coming into this audience from the outside I just want to make sure that you know it's along the lines of, of what you're expecting but um, I'll kind of hop into the images if, if nobody's got any questions. And uh, we got some of my favorites, uh, greatest hits, so to speak. Um, 
and really one of the areas that I like to focus is deep sky imaging. So I've got uh, several of, of that to look at. So uh, NGC 6888, which is the Crescent Nebula. Um, this is shot through the Celestron Edge HD 8 inch with a ZWO ASI 1600 camera. Shot a narrow band in RGB. And again, you know, along the lines of what I like to do, I just kind of zoom in on the details here. Uh, focus of this image was to develop the, um, the hydrogen nebulosity, which is this um, kind of spider web of, of hydrogen alpha detail shed by the internal wolf rayet star and then the outer shell of, of oxygen, which kind of envelops the whole nebula. So I was kind of happy with the way this turned out. Um, and I was able to get that look of the, uh, the oxygen kind of enveloping this whole uh, inner nebulosity. Uh, the deep exposure also allowed the background hydrogen to, sh to shine through there. This is in the heart of Cygnus, so you kind of get all that background HA neb nebulosity shining through. We do have one question here, Jason, if you want to take right, one. Go. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Pete. I'm not hearing anything if there's a question. Uh, try again, you're... Hmm. The question was, do you use multiple scopes at night? I do um, tend to. I, usually when I set up for a night of deep sky, that wasn't always the case, but now I, you know, I've got the equipment to run two parallel setups and I end up doing that. I have them configured completely differently as far as focal length. So I, I shoot with this Edge HD for long focal length targets. And then for wide field, I use that TPO ultra wide in a larger chipped camera. And I'll, I'll run those side by side. Um, as long as it's not too much of a headache and I don't, have too much hands on, I can kind of set that up to run and get some sleep while it's while it's going. If I set up the planetary scope, I can have three running simultaneously and I've done that, but it ends up being an all-nighter, so I try to avoid it. All right, thanks. Yeah, this one's uh, hot off the presses. I'm still working on this one. This is the Blue Snowball Nebula. Uh, focus on this image is I just wanted to get really in close uh, to the inner nebulosity, inspired by the, the famous Hubble image of this nebula. And um, the, the core of this thing is only uh, the bright, halo of the core is about 30 arc seconds in diameter and then the, the inner little ring is only 15 arc, arc seconds across. So this is pushing it as far as what I'm able to get out of my backyard setup. I drizzled this data um, to be uh, 4x the resolution of my native capture. So I'm definitely, definitely pushing in um, as far as I can go. And so this is a lesson in deconvolution, deconvolution skills, but I'm, I feel like I've made great progress. And you can see down in the bottom, my image alongside of the Hubble of that shot. Um, I focused on that inner core detail and, and also the, the outer nebulosity, which is less commonly seen. And that took uh, a long exposure of uh, oxygen and hydrogen to get that uh, nebulosity pulled out. So I ended up getting close to 30 hours total. This is uh, the Cocoon Galaxy, again shot with the 8-inch ed Edge HD. Interesting little one. Um, a lot of hydrogen alpha detail in this galaxy pair, and that's because they are kind of mid-merger or interaction. And so this larger and, and the smaller one are either passing through each other, or I guess probably have passed in the, in the uh, not so distant 
history. Um, and that gives rise to these starburst or uh, star formation regions, which are captured with the hydrogen alpha filter. This is NGC uh, 7380, the Wizard Nebula. And this is um, an example of what you can get with an achromatic scope if you shoot to narrow bands. So this was an HA and O3 bicolor combination using that six inch uh, Explore Scientific. And the reason I shoot with uh, pure narrow band in this scope is the issues that uh, befall an achromatic scope, the color fringing kind of go away when you're shooting narrow band. It allows you to get uh, crisp detail out of the scope. It does really well in hydrogen alpha and um, surprisingly well in, in oxygen too. So I was able to get this emission nebula um, using that scope, which is typically not a deep sky imaging scope. Here's a, another recent image. This is the dark shark and friends, they called it. The uh, shot through the TPO ultrawide with the ASI 2600 mm camera. So it's a little bit bigger chip and uh, a wide field. So this field ends up being, I think seven and a half tall degrees by five. Pretty good, pretty good field of view on this. And I, starts to give you that sense of uh, how these all nebulae all fit together. So I really like doing this. But to pull out dark nebula from my location, I, I really have to shoot a long exposure on the luminance. So this ends up being about a 30 hour image also. This is Messier 76, the little dumbbell. Um, I thought this was an interesting one because it kind of gives us a look at two uh, future states of our sun. These are both stellar mass stars. Um, the one at the top is in this red giant phase, and then the planetary nebula is actually after the, the star collapses into a white dwarf and uh, sheds its outer atmosphere. So I thought this was uh, just a cool one of a uh, cool look at stellar evolution uh, in the same frame. NGC 891, Edge on, Edge on Galaxy. This is actually the image that's in the uh, National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, England right now. Um, and was recognized in the Astronomy Photographer of the Year uh, competition. But I really like the dust lane details I was able to pull out of this one. This is kind of a zoomed out look of how we view our own Milky Way. The Crab Nebula, uh, the unique spin I tried to put on this image is I shot through a near infrared filter to give a look at the Pulsar Wind Nebula, which was famously imaged by Hubble, but it's hard to get from a, a traditional uh, broadband image or a narrowband image because you've get, got the the nebulosity of the Crab Nebula kind of overlaying all this. Well, one thing you get shooting in the near infrared is that um, you don't have the appearance of hydrogen or oxygen signal shining through. And so you get um, a really nice look at the Pulsar Wind Nebula and actually the, the disk around the Pulsar uh, of the Crab Nebula. So all that's shown in the blues and purples. And then I've got the uh, hydrogen alpha tendrils kind of overlaying that. All right, on to planetary imaging. Uh, this is something I continually strive to get better at, uh, but it is a challenge from Michigan. This one uh, is probably my best look at Mars. This was shot back at the last opposition. We have a nice opposition coming up in uh, December. Um, so I'm really looking forward to kind of getting back on Mars and, and doing some more shooting. Unfortunately, it gets into December in Michigan, and that's not too fun to be out there uh, planetary imaging. So hopefully I can get it all set up and image from the warmth of inside. But um, 
near opposition, Mars gets significant uh, fraction of the size of Jupiter. Um, I think up to what, 15 to 20 arc, min, or arc seconds. So pretty sizable and allows you to get getting close with some details um, at long focal length. This is Jupiter back from a few weeks ago. Somehow I managed to keep improving the images out of that uh, 12 inch Newtonian. So I'm still tweaking it and trying to get the collimation dialed in and get uh, some better details out of it. This is Venus through the Explore Scientific AR 152. I uh, kind of got this one lined up with a, a unique look because I, I shot through uh, near infrared and green and then ultraviolet filter to get the color separation on Venus. Allows you to start seeing some cloud detail. Um, this is kind of a narrow phase to, to get some, get to see the cloud detail. I've taken some at a larger phase uh, where you can see some striations in the clouds uh, using this setup. Uh, Venus has to be well positioned for this kind of imaging though, and it hasn't been in quite a while. As an example of some other uh, things you can do with planetary imaging, I've lined up Saturn for nine years now, although I haven't added my 2022 to this image. This shows what, planet, what the planet Saturn looks like over the years as we observe the tilt of the rings. Shot through various telescopes and cameras. Um, and some of the differing looks of the cloud decks, just because I've been developing my skills over time and, and some of the early stuff is not up to snuff, but I thought it was a pretty cool look. At, uh, over the years time lapse. Solar imaging is something I've done quite a, an extensive job of. I don't have too much in this um, presentation. I'm gonna hop through it really fast because I feel like I'm going kind of long. But uh, the hydrogen alpha filter, uh, the Daystar quark chromosphere on the Explore Scientific Scope gets into nice in-close details of active regions. I also have a calcium quark, which allows us to image in the near ultraviolet see some different um, structures on the surface of the sun. Done a lot of work trying different processing techniques um, with solar uh, inversion and, and contrast and enhan enhancements to get more of the chromospheric details to shine through. I pretty much uh, consider each one of my solar images to be different because I change up what I do each time. And another fun thing to do with solar is time-lapsing. Prominences are a lot of fun to image over time and, and see the changes happen over the span of, you know, an hour or so. It does require consistent conditions and that can sometimes be a challenge. Uh, lunar, I don't do too often, but this is a uh, look through the 8 inch IGHD and what they call a mineral moon, where you saturate the colors to, to show off the different elements in the regolith, where the, um, the earthy colors, the browns, are iron rich um, areas, and then the blues uh, are cast off by uh, to titanium dioxide in the in the soils. It's fun to do lunar composites, which um, means I just take uh, elements of the scene separately, earth shine, background stars, and a well-exposed lunar surface, and kind of blend those all in post-processing to give a, a 3D look and a, and an appearance uh, or 
an impressionistic view of what the moon looks like, where you can see the earth shine, the bright aspects all in the same image. Comets and asteroids, fun to image over periods of time and see the comet moving through space. This is uh, Atlas from a few years ago. It was a comet that broke up in the, in the night sky and then set in motion here by time lapsing it over a, a period of time. Everyone remembers Neowise. I never got a single nice stacked image because every time I image Neowise, this is what the conditions were like. Um, but it plays back nicely and you can see the ion tail and the dust tail here shining through these cloud layers. Every time I tried to stack this image though, it ended up as a hot mess just because of the, the clouds moving through. But again, it does look nice this way. And this one is all fresh um, over the last couple of weeks too. Um, back a couple of weeks ago when NASA smashed their DART space, spacecraft into the asteroid Dimorphos, I went back a couple of weeks later and imaged that asteroid. And I was able to see a real-time view of the asteroid moving against the star field, but um, once I took all those images and stacked them, I was able to pull out the dust tail too, which is a cool effect of the, uh, the impact. So basically mankind made a comet here. And so this linear tail extends back away, blown back by the uh, solar radiation pressure into the space trailing the asteroid. Just simply amazing to me that we can see the impact of mankind over this vast distance. This tail, I measured at a few arc minutes and given the distance of the asteroid, that equates to a, about an Earth diameter extending back away from Dimorphos. Uh, satellite images, I've done this a few times of uh, lunar or solar ISS transits. It's kind of a fun thing to do if you've got a solar filter or if you can find, line yourself up under the moon and uh, see an ISS transit. It's a fun thing to image. And so here I've played back a white light solar image or a series of white light solar images I shot as a video of the ISS moving in front of the sun. Milky Way and Nightscape, uh, I get out to do this occasionally. Like I said, I, I was awarded an uh, artist in residence on Mackinac Island. So I did a lot of nightscape photography on Mackinac Island and got some various sites around the island uh, with the Milky Way or night, nightscape elements behind, um, you know, these scenic landmarks. That was kind of fun. A couple views of our truck with the, uh, Milky Way arching overhead. And this one is shot from the fort on Mackinac Island looking over the straits with the, the town in the foreground. So this is an extreme H, HDR of the scene. Kind of common tourist photos, but done in a, with an astrophotographer's eye uh, with elements that you don't normally see in tourist photos. Special events are fun. This is the uh, total solar eclipse of 2017, which I was fortunate enough to go drive out and see. This is my HDR composite of that event. And a few years later, this is the partial solar eclipse shot behind the Mackinac Bridge. So I lined myself up purposefully um, from this vantage point to take this shot. Didn't expect the bird to be in the foreground, but it kind of makes it, in my opinion. Took a trip to Iceland and shot the Aurora Borealis. That's a fun thing to do. I've gone from Michigan a few times, though it's always low on the horizon, Michigan. This was my one and only time of seeing the Aurora overhead, visible with the naked eye. It was just simply amazing. So this is, I think, about 45 minutes of shooting short exposures to see it uh, overhead. You can really see the 
the phenomenon with the naked eye, but the colors come out mainly in the camera exposures. And I don't do this often, but I, this is uh, shooting deep sky from up north under dark skies. I set the GoPro camera up behind the telescope rigs I was using. And you can see me shooting the, the Milky Way there with the camera and the lens and the two telescope rigs doing their thing as the moon rises and then the dawn follows it. All right, well, that brings me to the to the end. I hope um, everyone is able to stick around and, and uh, found this interesting. But um, if you want to see more of my work or have any questions, want to contact me, uh, these are the places you can find me. Um, as far as social media, I'm very active on my Instagram page. It's uh, grown quite a bit, so uh, keeps me kind of hooked. But locally, I participate in the Plymouth Astrophotography Group, which is a, a special interest group in the Metro Detroit area. It's got some nice participation. And I also host a website where I, I've been trying to, to do blog entries and uh, keep more of my images up there. But I've also have um, directions to my other social media accounts if one or the other of these kind of fits your interest. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter under the same handle. I use the vast reaches or Reddit, or um, I still have images hosted up on Astrobin, though I'm not very active there these days. So it's kind of a little blurb about where you can find me. Um, you can find links to email me or direct message me, whatever you want to, to get in touch. But at this point, I'll take questions from whoever has it. and. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. All right, thank you, Jason. Yeah. We do have, uh, we can ask a few questions here in person or if anyone at home has them on Zoom. Uh, I'd prefer you ask them verbally because that's less work for me. I don't have to look on the chat and read anything. So uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or raise your hand and I can try to give you the microphone because it should be working. Yeah, I didn't look at the chat, although I'll pull it up here. Um, see. Uh, quick question for you, Jason. Uh, yeah, it's, go it's, ahead. yeah, it's Bruce Murray. Um, one great, great presentation, great images. Uh, Thank you. I, I'm just curious that you're, you mentioned that for some of your deep sky that you do very short or shorter exposures. And I assume by the amount of uh, imaging you're doing, you're really collecting hundreds of images that you need to stack in Pix Insight. Yes. What, what, what's the typical time it takes you to, to stack that many images? <laughs> well, I mean, that's a good question. It, you know, it does take some horsepower um, on the computing side, um, and it takes a ton of storage capacity. Um, but generally speaking, you know, I've got an aging PC here. It handles it fairly well, um, but it does take quite a bit of time. So, you know, when I'm stacking stuff, say in Pick it, Picks Insight, I'll launch that process and um, just let it go. And sometimes, you know, it might take an hour or two to, to get through all the images, depending on, on what's there. Um, and that's not unheard of. Um, I've got, you know, some processes I do, like um, deconvolution and things that will take quite a bit of time. Um, you know, so those are kind of a hit a button and walk away kind of things. So that's really how I handle it. Um, oh, okay. I mean, I, I, just, I was expecting it was like an overnight thing or, or something. Well, yeah, I mean, it can be if, if, if I get into the thousands of images, you know, I, maybe I won't bother coming back. I'll just launch it before I go to bed and, and come back, you know, pick it up in the morning. Right. Okay. But, you know, the biggest problem I come up against really on the computing side is not necessarily processing time, but it's storage capacity. Uh, I generally c collect a ton of data. And if I'm shooting planetary or, or solar, just a single session can get into the hundreds of gigabytes. And so saving that data um, 
for enough time to come back and stack it all um, in the process of stacking that all, especially for like solar time lapses. It can, man, it can, it can you know, take forever. It could take a full day to stack up all that data. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, storing it, if I need to store it long-term, um, I built a network attached storage to uh, to manage that. And I've got, I think four, four 18 terabyte hard drives in there right now that are getting close to filled. So I'm, you know, I'm pushing 40 or 50 terabytes data um, just that I still need to get back to and process. It's not um, something I brag about because it's a little bit embarrassing that I, I capture so much that I, I still need to process, but it's kind of a reality. But um, you bring up a good point of taking short exposures, and I do that for a reason. Um, I could take longer exposures or deeper exposures as subs, and I generally don't because I don't want to overexpose my stars. But if you go back and look at some of my deep sky work, and I'll kind of uh, try to flip back to one here. I take a lot of pride and I, I focus on preserving my star definition, colors and details. So you notice a lot of my images, I, I, I don't do maybe the typical astrophotographer thing of trying to reduce or minimize my stars. I really like them as an element of the composition. So I've, I keep them prominent and I like the, you know, the variation in size and colors. And one of the ways I do that is by sh taking short exposures as my subs and that uh, preserves the color information so I don't blow out the, the uh, cores of the stars and it blows, uh, it preserves the, the profile or the, the kind of Gaussian distribution of the star. So those are two things I do consciously to, uh, in my mind, improve my results. But the side effect of that is storage and processing time for sure. Yeah. I have noticed on some of your narrowband images, you also do uh, a number of RGB uh, captures. Is that just for the stars? Yeah, um, yeah, that's true. Um, if you look at if you look at an image, of, like say for example, this little dumbbell nebula, I, I shot it mainly as a, a narrow band image. And a lot of times I'll use the, the, the HA um, as a luminance layer for the stars, but I really like natural star color. So I'll always, almost always go back when possible and capture a set of RBG, RGB images to use as the star color information. Yeah, that looks good. I mean, it's awesome. Uh, Any you know, other I, questions? Yeah, go ahead. I was asking if anyone else has any other questions. Uh, I actually do, if, you, if I may. Um, I'm sure. quite new, quite new to this, so I'm uh, very much a beginner here at astrophotography, but. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, I see some chatter about uh, capturing uh, video frames as opposed to discrete images. And I'm wondering uh, if there's pros and cons here. Uh, I get the impression that you do discrete images and uh, you can get more detail that way. Am, am I reading that correctly? It depends on the, the type of astrophotography you're doing. And I don't know what your question is specific about. Um, deep sky pretty much always um, I take static images, but in, in the case of planets, um, and forgive me if that's not your question, but I'm assuming it is because you're asking about video format, but um, for planetary, I shoot videos and it's uncompressed video. And really what that means is that it's a, it's a series of static uncompressed images packaged as a video. Um, so really what you're doing is capturing static images, short static images. The benefits of using a video format or uncompressed video format is it's a single file instead of managing hundreds of thousands of individual files. 
So that's really the only reason why planetary is shot in a video format. But I hope that answers the question. Uh, it does. And those are the two things I'm looking at are planetary. I'm just just getting into now. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't know whether it was better to go one way or the other. So I was curious on your take there. Yeah, in my opinion, it's better to take video just because at the end of the night, you're dealing with a handful of files instead of <laughs> hundreds of thousands. But, you know, it depends on how many you take, too. You know, if I didn't start out shooting thousands of frames for planetary. You know, I'd take a handful of frames and stack those. But over time, I came to the realization that um, taking as many frames as possible and sorting through those after the fact um, by quality grading them and stacking only the best ones gave me the best results. So I end up capturing as many as absolutely possible. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate your input. Yeah. And Mark, be, be sure to join us next month for Agapios because he'll be doing Mars imaging live so you can see how it's done in real time. Yes, that sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, I kind of had one, uh, you know, that real quick uh, live video of my, or a screen capture of uh, shooting Saturn here. So um, I use fire capture, but this is kind of an example of the, the, um, the user, user interface for that software. If you look at what I'm doing here, um, I'm setting up to take a capture of frames through a red filter. So I'm adjusting the exposure um, to get it consistent with the green and the blue frames I captured. And then I press the record button um, on a sequence of 5,000 frames. So I record this as a .ser format which is an uncompressed video format. So it's basically shooting TIFF files, 5,000 TIFF files and packaging them as a, a video. All right, I see. I see, thank you. Any other questions? I have a quick question. Sure, we'll take one more. I'm new, very new to this, and I'm just curious about the number of hours you're shooting and when you do you just go back and get started at the same time at night? Or, you know, how, you know, obviously you can't be shooting during 24 hours because the sun comes up. So I'm just wondering yeah. how many times you go out to come up with that number of shots. So, yeah, what I use to plan and shoot software wise is um, Sequence Generator Pro. And uh, I don't think I have a screen capture of that, but Sequence Generator Pro, and uh, there's other software that'll do this too, and there's even free software that'll do it, like um, Nina is one you may have heard of, which is um, a similar um, capability where you input a target that you want to image. You input the number of frames you're targeting to get, um, and the different filters you're planning on shooting, shooting through. What that software will do is um, take the coordinates from that target. It will point the telescope. It will take an image. It will correct its pointing um, to exactly center that target. Now that's called plate solving. Once it's plate solved and tracking, it will keep that target in the field of view all night long or as long as you want it to. And so I'll just start shooting frames um, as many as I can get in that night. And if I don't hit my target um, number of frames, I'll come back the next imaging night, um, do the same thing. It'll center on that target. It'll shoot more of them. And it keeps going like that until I get the number of frames that I targeted for that target and that filter. And I do that for each filter. I come up with a package of all my files, the total exposure time I was um, planning on getting. And that might take 
15, 20 imaging nights or um, over the span of multiple months sometimes to get these images. But from my point of view, I've become accustomed to the results I get. I like the results I get getting that amount of exposure time. So that's kind of what I go after. And it's okay to me to take that long shooting a target um, because I got my rig repeatable. I can come back to it and it's really straightforward for me to do it that way. And so I can collect all that data at the end of the process and put it together and assemble it into an image. And, and that's kind of, you know, how I run the business at this point. All right. Well, very good. Thank you. That was, that was very helpful. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, especially for those of you on Zoom and definitely those of you here in person for attending. And Jason, we want to thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, yeah, thanks. And, you know, I, I just want to stress if anybody's got questions for me or if they you know, want to get in touch with me, just hop over to my website or, or find me on one of these social platforms. I'm, I'm open to answering questions for people. You know, I, I enjoy the process. I like talking about it and, and I want to see people improve and, and succeed. So if I, if I can help um, do that or inspire, then by all means, get in touch with me. Great. And uh, one more thing I wanted to uh, mention, um, or a couple things, is um, I just want to thank you for again giving the presentation because uh, I, I didn't mention earlier, it took us uh, took me six tries to find someone to give a talk for, for this meeting. So, uh, so I want to thank you for uh, being the sixth time the charm. <laughs> and uh, an appreciation of you giving the talk, and since you're a fellow Michigan amateur, if you are ever interested on a really cloudy night here in Michigan, if you want to use our remote telescope in Arizona, you're welcome to it. I can give you a couple nights on it for free. Well, I would I would not turn down that offer. I, I appreciate it. Yep, we have a 20 inch plane wave and a Takahashi piggybacked on a Paramount 2 under Bortle 2 skies. It's it's incredible. Oh, that, that sounds like fun. Yep, so it's currently offline, but... Uh, but uh, we hope to have it back up by the end of November. And uh, so if you're thinking uh, the weather is terrible here and I, I want to do some imaging, just uh, just drop me an email. We'll make it happen. Well, I, I really appreciate you having me. Um, and I, I'm, like I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm so impressed with the participation you have in this group, um, how many people logged on. I don't know how many are still here after I battled for an hour, but um, I, I, uh, I would like to, you know, participate more with the group. I yeah. enjoyed it. Yep. You are definitely welcome to join us for future Zoom meetings, and you're certainly welcome to uh, stay for the second half of the meeting. We're going to take a short break, everyone, but uh, once we get back, uh, we'll just do like a little show and tell, a little bit of uh, astrophotography news, and then we'll call it a night, because I know it is clear out there, and I'm sure some of us are anxious to get out there and start imaging, but uh, let's take a short uh, five-minute break, and uh, we'll be back in... Uh, Five minutes. <laughs> so, so thanks again, Jason. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, All Jason. Right. Great talk. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, to those of you on Zoom and those of you that actually uh, showed up, which we are very, very grateful for. So, let's just go through the astrophotography news. Um, uh, first, as always, we have uh, members uh, share their images. Of course, uh, just a couple weeks ago uh, for our general meeting, it's always astrophotography night. So we shared a lot of pictures that night. But I know at least a couple of us have uh, images to share. And I have one. So um, one that I did not share two weeks ago that I didn't have time to process. So let me share my Pix Insight screen. And uh, there we go. So uh, I don't have the technical details listed like I usually do on a slide, but this was taken uh, from Owl Observatory at the Kalamazoo Nature Center with our Teleview NP101IS refractor. And the camera is a, a ZWO uh, ASI 071 MC uh, color CMOS camera. And I believe, I'm pretty sure this is 22 10 minute exposures. And 
that works out to what roughly three hours and 40 minutes or so, um, if I recall uh, correctly, or trying to do the math in my head real quick. So um, I gotta make that chat thing go away. The chat's really annoying. Uh, one thing we can do, if you don't know where this is, I can bring up uh, the astrometry here and generate a uh, finder chart because I forgot to do it earlier. But if you have all the uh, uh, data saved in the FITS file, you can easily pull up a little finder chart, as uh, many of you well know. And uh, there it is. I'll make that go away. So here it is. Here's my little finder chart, which I can move over here. So you can see this is the uh, star Deneb, one corner of the summer triangle. This is uh, Seder. And I believe the actual NGC object, NGC 6910, I think that's like a star cluster nearby, but this is basically the uh, uh, Seder region with all that nebulosity in Cygnus along the plane of the Milky Way. So that is the one image that I have to share that I uh, didn't have time to process uh, two weeks ago. Can you folks see it here or should I bring the lights down a little bit? We can bring the lights down a little. Everyone at home can see it really well. All right. So uh, let's see, I know uh, uh, Pete had one to share. Let me, uh, I, I got you bookmarked, Pete. Yep, you're very special. You, you've been bookmarked. And uh, internet's here a little slow. So let me properly share uh, the, the screen there. Oh, we gotta stop sharing. And I got to share again. Oh, I don't know why it doesn't come up on there. But... Okay, Pete, you want to? Yep. Um, this is uh, obviously Jupiter. Um, oops. Um, I took this, um, I think, a couple weeks ago, actually. I think I had it for the Astro Photo Night. Um, same thing as with Jason. I have the same scope. It's a 12 inch F4 Newtonian. Um, I, it's a color camera. I'm using the CWO for. 462 MC, and I put the IR cut filter in front of there so you don't get crazy color effects. Um, I run it on my uh, astrophysics mount. So, but yeah, this was, um, I'm just trying to remember here. Yes, I stacked uh, 16,000 frames for this one. Um, it was interesting because, like Jason says, you collect a lot of data, and I was shooting at around 150 frames a second for uh, three or four minutes, which is the max before rotation takes effect. Um, so I just did that all night long, and next thing you know, I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes I had to transfer. So, but but I'm definitely improving. Um, I was encouraged to see Jason shoot with his the same scope, but I see I need to get a bigger uh, teleview, so I'm gonna try to get the five X now. Add that to the list, <laughs> but that's it. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Pete. All right. Um, I don't know if anyone else here has any pictures to share, but remember, um, if we do meet in person in the future, if you want to share any images live here at the meeting, uh, you can either email them to me or just uh, hand me a, a, a USB drive right before the meeting. I can load them on the computer. Uh, but of course, if we also have people uh, on Zoom. If anybody, if any of our members on Zoom want to share any recent images, you're certainly welcome to do so. Or uh, if we have any guests that want to share maybe an image or two, because we are running a little long on time, I know. All right, here are none. We'll go ahead and move on. But as mentioned, uh, we did share lots of images just two weeks ago, and you can find that meeting on our YouTube channel. Uh, another thing we like to do is we like to share interesting images from other astrophotographers. And uh, that's another thing I wanted to do. So let me go back to the browser. And uh, just today, I just thought I would share this. Alan Dyer, a uh, well-known Canadian astrophotographer. He's a friend of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. Gave a great presentation for us uh, back in 2016. And so he just posted this today. Uh, as you can see, it's a, a, a mosaic of three images where it, you know, it doesn't say it here, but if you click on Alt, you can see it's, it's, it's a three section uh, uh, panorama. And we can just click that to make that a little bit better. And you can see Alan, he's really, really good at that nightscape stuff. And I figured I would share this because there, there was one thing over the summer that I participated in is the uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada 
had their uh, annual meeting, which they held on Zoom. And uh, I uh, uh, paid to attend that. And they had lots of great talks, but one of those was by uh, Alan Dyer. And it is now available for free on YouTube. Now I feel like I got taken paying the, because I basically paid to watch this talk. But of course, I, I did attend many other talks. But uh, uh, about two months later, they released it for free. So if you really are into landscape photography or really want to get into it, uh, this is a great uh, uh, talk. You know, it's about two hours long, but he goes through in detail of how to take, you know, the images and how to process them, doing layers and all that fancy stuff. So, uh, so I really, really encourage you to uh, check out uh, this uh, presentation on YouTube. You can basically go to, uh, you know, just do a search for Royal Astronomical Society of Canada or RAS Canada or uh, how to shoot and process Milky Way nightscapes and you should be able to find it. Or you can just go back in our Twitter timeline because I did tweet about it uh, when they released it back in August, I think. So it's pretty easy to find. And uh, one more image. I'm sure many of you saw it. I have to share a different screen here. I don't know how to switch screens when it's sharing the full screen there. But let me go over to Photoshop here. And I'm sure everybody saw this picture, right? <laughs> so it's not exactly from another astrophotographer per se, but of course this is the James Webb Space Telescope's version of M16, and this is the full resolution version, not like the little wussy JPEG or PNG version. This is the big massive like 160 megabyte uh, TIFF file. Uh, one thing I think I'll do is I'm going to rotate it uh, uh, clockwise. No, I, I, looks weird that way to me. Uh, I guess I want to go counterclockwise. Yeah, there we go. That's much better. And uh, let's just uh, let's just zoom in, shall we, for, for fun. Let's go closer, 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 closer. Let's keep going. Closer. Look at the eggs. Webb can't even pierce those and see any little protostars inside. I'm going to keep zooming in there. So the detail is uh, pretty extraordinary. I can keep zooming in on this one too. Yeah. No, yeah, you can only uh, see those in infrared. So, of course, I encourage you to go to the James Webb Space Telescope page and pull down. Uh, the full resolution version and explore this in more detail because good golly is there a lot to see so, so we'll go ahead and stop sharing there and uh, uh, moving on uh, there's uh, other news i wanted to share um also that happened over the summer so let's go back to firefox one more time and again i gotta uh, make the chat go away and uh, click on here and over the summer, uh, the people that uh, created Pix Insight, you know, they have, of course, a Pix Insight uh, channel on YouTube. And they are now in the process of working on a 36, I think it's 36 part series uh, with an introduction to Pix Insight. Uh, I haven't watched any of them yet. I'm kind of waiting for maybe the whole thing to come out at once so I can just kind of binge watch them. <laughs> Because um, I hate to get to, you know, part uh, 11 there and, oh, that, that's it, I'm not, I need more. So um, if you really want to learn Pix Insight, this looks like a great way to do it. You know, um, there are lots of videos online, but the one thing that irks me about some of the videos online is they're like one massive lesson. I actually kind of prefer them broken up into separate techniques so I can kind of follow along instead of having to jump around a video or something like that. So I'm looking forward for them to complete the entire 36 part series and figure out how to uh, use Pix Insight a lot better because I've gotten better in the past uh, couple of weeks, but still there, there, there's a great deal to learn. All right, uh, moving on. The next thing we have is new astrophotography related equipment and software. So uh, since I'm already up here yapping, I'll go first is uh, let me bring this in front of the camera so everyone can see. I'll, I'll show the box first because 
When I used to be a uh, telescope dealer, one of my kind of rules, at least with telescopes, you know, this is a mount, so it doesn't really count, but if it comes in a pretty box, you know, if your telescope comes in a pretty box, that usually means it's a pretty junky telescope. But maybe this doesn't really apply so much for mounts. So yes, I got myself a, a Skywatcher Star Adventurer uh, GTI, which I have here. And uh, I was gonna give a little demo so you can see how, how it moves. So let me make that go away. And we'll just turn it on real quick. See if I can connect. Oh, I have to go to the Wi-Fi. So this is gonna take longer than I thought. How does it do that? Uh, well, no, we're already connected. Well, that's good. Because I haven't connected anything else. So during Jason's talk, he showed uh, the original Star Adventurer, you know, the uh, two eye, I believe it's called, which is a great, you know, uh, tracking platform. And this is basically also classified as a tracker, but it is a full regular German equatorial mount. I just didn't bother to put the counterweight shaft on because, you know, I don't have a telescope up on here, obviously. And uh, so this thing, you know, has full go to. Uh, it, it does track in both axes, unlike most sky trackers. This thing does track in right ascension and declination. It has a capacity of just 11 pounds, which a lot of people found uh, disappointing. Uh, they were hoping it was closer to 20, but if you want one with 20 pounds, just get yourself a, a Celestron AVX, you know, because they have basically a 20 pound uh, capacity. Uh, so I, I currently have an Astrotech uh, 65 millimeter quad to get uh, to, to uh, put on this, along with my camera and lenses and stuff like that. But uh, that scope is an f 6.5, so eventually I'm going to sell it and probably get either um, a the 60 millimeter that Pete has, the Sharp Star, yeah, the, yeah, the Sharp Star 60, or probably the uh, the Radian Raptor 61. Um, because that thing only weighs like four pounds. You know, this thing, again, only has an 11 pound uh, capacity. It comes with many other features. Of course, it does have auto guiding. Uh, you can get a hand control, but of course, most people can either use a, like an iPad or iPhone or another smartphone to control it. And, um, and of course, uh, there's even a port to connect to a camera so, so you can control your Canon camera through uh, the SynScan app. And if you're curious to see what this little thing sounds like, I think we're ready to go here. Let me bump up the speed a bit. So. <laughs> That's not too bad. It won't wake up the neighbors at night like the old uh, Mead telescopes, which were called coffee grinders. So I'm looking forward to using this thing. Uh, future add-ons be besides the um, uh, 61 millimeter, is I would like to get a uh, ASI Air because I want to make this as portable as possible. I don't want to have to worry about the laptop or anything. And um, it's great. You know, it's really, really light. Weighs like the whole thing weighs like five, six pounds, and, and again, it holds about eleven pounds. But uh, I didn't mean to get this so soon because you know we're getting into cloudy season here in Michigan. But uh, I, I signed up for OPT's uh, email list when they got more in, and they emailed me, and I was like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> uh, so I have the uh, Ioptron Sky Tracker, the original version that just basically tracks, uh, and I'm going to sell that. Uh, so if anybody wants it, drop me an email. I'm going to include the uh, uh, Teleview uh, Telepod tripod, and I have the the optional counterweight system and stuff like that. So it's a very, very great, simple sky tracker. Uh, this one's a little more complicated, but uh, it's great. And by the way, I did get the um, um, Radian uh, carbon fiber tripod. You had to pay, of course, so a bit extra for the tripod compared to the, the Skywatcher version, but you can um, undo, oh, here it is, undo the latch and just uh, uh, pop this out or, or press this in and voila. You just take it off and you can just pop it right back on. Well, allegedly, there we go. 
So it's a really quick uh, uh, tripod too. You don't have to, you know, screw it in. Although right now, you know, you when you first get it, you screw in this part, and for the life of me, I cannot now get this damn thing off. <laughs> so it, it, it doesn't really need to come off, but one day it, be, it might be useful to get it off. But right now, I can't get it off. All right, so there's my latest acquisition. And uh, many of you ha have probably seen this already, but I thought I would share this. Uh, this is a future addition to the KAS remote telescope in Arizona. And uh, this is gonna replace the stock focuser on our Takahashi FSQ 106 refractor. So this is a moonlight uh, night crawler uh, uh, WR35 focuser. Uh, this thing cost about, what, $3,300. So it's fairly expensive, uh, but it's going to make a great addition to the remote telescope. The Takahashi is going to be extremely powerful when and if we ever get this thing on. Yes, and it does rotate. It has a little fancy screen that will probably wash out all of our images. But I'm sure we could turn it off. And so there are some new acquisitions from both uh, me and the club, and uh, uh, Pete had one to share too. in front of the camera. Yeah, that, that size envy here. Um, I, um, I'm in the process of upgrading my 12-inch uh, F4 reflector, um, and part of it is upgrading the focuser. So I decided to get the Moonlight um, CRL 2.5, which is a two and a half inch uh, focuser, um, motorized, that's all, how you sell it now. Um, so this will be able to hold my imaging train pretty easily. A good selling feature for me was the it's a, it's a threaded draw tube, so I can thread my uh, paracord in there, and the rest of the optical train is all threaded, so you don't have tilt, pinching, and all that fun stuff. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting this installed as part of a bigger project to upgrade the scope where I'm getting a carbon fiber tube for the, the optics are actually really good. Um, so I'll get this attached to the carbon fiber. It's being made in Germany right now. Um, Hopefully it is. <laughs> and then um, I'm also getting a new um, Astro Systems uh, spider and uh, secondary holder to make sure nothing turns. And a carbon fiber too. Yes, mentioned the carbon fiber from from Germany. Yeah, I'm because a lot some of the um, uh, coma correctors out there actually go larger than two inch coma correctors you can get two and a half inch so it's just a larger and plus it for when the light comes in on, on such a steep angle for the uh, fast f ratio you don't get the vignetting um, and it's just built more massive to handle heavier loads and my camera for filter wheel off axis guider it starts driving up it's only around eight or nine pounds so it just needs to be big it'd be better for the night crawler actually they make a light crawler for newtonians it's a little bit thinner so all right thank you pete i think i think we're just about done here let me i i gotta get my agenda back here make sure i'm not forgetting anything but i think we're just about done here oops it keeps rotating on me quit doing that <laughs> okay uh, oh, a few quick updates uh, of course that kind of segued into the uh, uh kas remote telescope and you may have heard me mention earlier that uh, it is currently down. We were hoping that, you know, we usually hope to have it online by October 1st. But the observatory roof is down. There's a bad uh, bushing. And uh, Mike Patton won't get back until, uh, get back to Arizona until like a day or two before Thanksgiving. But uh, getting the roof fixed should be fairly easy. And then we hope to have the telescope online shortly thereafter. Uh, for those of you that maybe you want to try to use it to image, or at least a handful of us do use it, and we're always looking for more. And um, what else did I want to mention with the remote scope? Oh, yes, the online. So because we're going to be uh, getting the scope up late this year, uh, that means the online viewing sessions where we basically get on Zoom, because those are definitely only uh, Zoom only, uh, those are going to be delayed. So, so we're going to start in December, but we'll do two online viewing sessions in January to make up for the one we miss in November. And then we do the uh, uh, last one in February. Because we always do four a season. 
And uh, so, so that's why we're going to do two in January. So uh, you can see the full schedule for the online viewing sessions on our website. So be sure you check that out. Uh, Owl Observatory update. Uh, some of you may have noticed uh, young Henry Polderman was sitting in the back here. He is currently going out to the Nature Center to use Owl Observatory. Uh, and in part of the form, uh, it asked, are you willing to share? And he said no. So if anyone was thinking about going out there to join him, I guess you can't. <laughs> but hey, <laughs> what's he going to do if someone shows up and, and, and joins him? So there's not much he can do. So, of course, the observatory uh, here in town is always available for members to use as well. You just have to take the, the uh, training session. Okay, next month, and, and I mentioned this uh, a couple times, once up front, once right after the talk, is next month, uh, Agapios Alia is going to join us again. It's very rare. We have the same speaker uh, twice in one year. But uh, when Agapios gave his general presentation on planetary imaging back in February, he offered to do a live Mars viewing session because Mars is getting closer to Earth. We're getting closer to opposition. So he's going to join us uh, on November 18th at 8 o'clock Eastern time, our time. For him, it'll be 3 o'clock in the morning. The Mars will be high overhead. And again, he's going to image Mars live. He's going to process the results live. So, so you can really see how it's done step by step if, if you want to get into planetary imaging. And if there's nothing else, we will go ahead and officially adjourn the first Astrophoto SIG meeting of the season. So uh, those of you in person especially, thanks for joining us. And uh, that goes for those of you on Zoom as well. Thanks for attending.